Hey guys, it's your girl Leslie and today we is going to be reading A Drop of Color, Bloody Painter X Listener Up In Here. So this is not chapter 3, this is actually chapter 2 for the purpose of the recap. So basically, um, we're currently in our room cleaning it and just kind of like deep cleaning and like scrubbing and everything because remember this is a very old house that hasn't been touched in like centuries and uh we had to clean it up and everything and make sure it's livable pretty much um and i'm, I'm assuming i'm assuming we have allergies because if i if, if this person had allergies well if we had to clean this room oh hell no this would be a utter nightmare um literally an utter nightmare and then while we were cleaning, we were thinking about um, our job and what we would have to get for a job, where we would go, um, what would be the best option and everything like that. And we were thinking all about it because um, the nearest job is like, I think, 30 minutes to an hour away just from the house since it's like really closed off and everything. Um, and I'm pretty sure they live like in a small town that... That there's not really many opportunities, like, as the city does or something like that. But, um, that we would have to, like, try and make it work. But we would have to wake up early and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We suddenly are brought back in our thought, train, train, train of thought, about the basement door and why it was so, I guess, mysterious, I suppose. Or, like, interesting, you know? Like, it's calling out to you to figure it out, find it, why it's so mysterious or something like that. But this is all while we're cleaning our room, by the way. <laughs> and then we discovered the closet when it was time to clean the closet. The closet was not budging, so we ended up calling our brother, um, which I forgot his... Oh, his name is Gray, I just saw it. Um, he en ended up opening the freaking door with whatever strength he had and when he opened the door and we were cleaning it we saw something shiny in the corner we grabbed it and it was a shiny key and it appears to be the key that would open the basement door and we were like what so eventually you know later after you finish cleaning and everything um you never really told anybody um and you just kind of kept it to yourself because you were planning on kind of like getting more into it when your parents were sleeping. But then you were like, dad doesn't really sleep till really late at night and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, while you're thinking that, your parents finally brought dinner, which is basically just pizza. Your brother didn't want to go get it because of some, you know, because you guys were originally adopted. It, I, I really need to mention that. And... Um, you guys aren't just used to, like, moving, like, you know, it's hard to get used to moving, like, crazy and everything. And I understand that. Um, and he just didn't really feel like talking to his parents at all. So, um, or if he calls them his parents, I, you know. And, uh, pretty much you brought him the pizza. You w you took a nap. Woke up, I think, at around, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you woke up around, like, 2 in the morning. And you navigated to... The basement door. Dun dun dun. And you managed to open it. And that's where it ends for the recap. <laughs> that was the most dullest way I ever. <laughs> I've ever actually. That was so dull. Oh my goodness. Well anyways. <laughs> Alright y'all. So we are officially in chapter 3. A blinding light. By the way I will post the link to the music that they just added. In the description down below. Because for copyright reasons, I probably won't be able to play it. <laughs> uh, so, alright y'all. So, chapter 3, A Blinding Light. Immediately upon seeing the doorframe, you stood on the top step and peered curiously into the, into the dark depths of the basement below. The first few stairs made it up 
made up of the cold and hard material of concrete were visible to you, as well as the gray dry wall on either side of you. Yet beyond that, all you could see was darkness. No matter how long you stood there and allow your eyes to adjust to the lack of light, there were no signs of age on either walls, ceilings, or floor, and very much con con contrasted with the rest of the house. Yet you knew that not only was the very the, was the ve the room very very old, but that it hasn't been used in a very long time, or excuse me, for a very long time. Maybe you were even the first to enter for y in years. You wondered what Grayson would have thought if you ha would have invited him to explore with you. Most likely, he would have rolled his eyes and stated that this was boring, before groggily heading back up to his room and indulging into his reclusive tendencies. For, the, for, you, for you, though, regardless of the fact that you were absolutely nothing notable, that there was absolutely nothing notable to see, you just knew that there was something more to this place, a secret hidden in this musty room, just waiting for you to uncover. Releasing the breath of air that you didn't even notice that you were holding in, you slowly began to descend the stairs one at a time. As your foot came into contact with each stair, no noise was made from either your foot or the surface. You once again noted how much different this was from the rest of the house, as the house itself had the tendency to make noises and complaints of its own whenever of of its own whenever you so much even budged an inch. Each and every stare that you came across produced the same results. No noise whatsoever. In fact, each step that you took down, it almost seemed as if your world was growing all m the more quiet. Each decibels, decibels, whatever. Each the decibels decreasing just by a few each step with each step downward. You wondered if it was just your imagination. Coming to a stop at the bottom of the stairs, you marveled in wonder at just how intriguing this room was. Your eyes had finally seemed to get used to the inky darkness of the room, and while it was still shadowy and a bit difficult to see, you could still make things out and discern and dis discern what they what they were. And there was certainly a lot to see, while the walls floor and ceiling still maintained its blatant color of gray all the all the items in the room were anything but that approaching the closest object to you with pure fascination you ran your fingers across the smooth and cool surface of the wooden cabinet before you painted in the most calming and beautiful shade of blue this piece of furniture seemed to be handmade and wonderfully crafted at that Sure, there were a bit of dust that coated the surface, but that was to be expected. This was the most like, likely an antique, and no doubt the work of the original owner. I scanning the expanse of the large and spacious room, you noted just how packed it was, all with furniture, clocks, old-fashioned toys and dolls, wooden boxes, tables, rocking chairs, lamps, and just about any other item that you would find in an antique shop in between. Each item was painted in every color, in every shade of every color imaginable, all crafted by hand. You suppose that to any other person, this room may be considered creepy, yet to you, it was a place of wonder and enchantment, and worthy of exploration. The kneeling down Excuse me, leaning down in front of the beautiful blue cabinet that you came across, you decided that your exploration began here. Upon further inspection, you came to realize that the cabinet had two doors made of glass in, fr in the front that you were able to pull open. If you, were, if you would get them open, you would be granted access to the rows and rows of wooden boxes that sat upon the shelves inside. You tugged on the handles as gently as possible, for you had no clue how old this cabinet was. For all you knew, the wood may be, the wood may, the wood may have began to weaken due to sitting in the musty basement for as long as it had been. 
judging by the layers of dust sitting on top. It had been a while. It didn't take much effort for the doors to open, much due to your pleasure. Hands glossing over each box that was before you. You, you picked one up and observed it every now and then. When one came to intri intrigue you, of course, each box came about with its own unique color scheme, and fancy designs were meticulously carved into the wood of each one. You tried to open a few of the boxes, yet most of them seemed to be locked stubbornly shut. You wondered if you could find the keys to these boxes somewhere within this huge space of untraversed items. Just as you were about to stand up and find something else to look at, your eyes caught one of the boxes sitting in the darkest corner of the cabinet. Fingers curling around it gently, you pulled it out and held it in the palm of your hand. It was small enough to fit comfortably nested in one palm, most likely the tiniest of the bunch. The box was painted in the brightest shade of lilac, and little flower designs were carved into the woodworking of the box. I wonder if this one's locked too, you murmured softly under your breath, and pulled gently at the lid. To your most up to your utmost surprise, it opened. Almost immediately upon opening the box, a tinkling, soft music began to play. And it was at this moment that you finally realized all of these boxes in this cabinet that before you were music boxes, yet the melody was strange. It was just a tad off key, and the sounds clashed together against each other in a manner that would most what would probably consider unpleasant, if not creepy. Almost as if the person who had constructed this song had no idea how sound worked. For you seriously doubted that mere age alone would cause the sound of this music box to become un that unhinged. You found yourself not quite minding the tune, though. So you continued to observe as the muted box sang out of its stra a strange song. <clears throat> The inside of the music box was pale green, and in the place where typically a ballerina or some other character of that sort spun around in circles in a normal music box, there was a porcelain figure of a woman holding a baby. She was absolutely beautiful, with long flowing black hair that even though was made out of ceramic material, still seemed to flutter as she spun in circles. Tiny blue dots on her sheet white face indicated that her eyes were the most beautiful of cer cerulean yeah. and she wrote a simple amethyst colored dress the baby that she held wrapped in a cream white and cream white blankets matched her hair and her eye color perfectly you smiled peacefully as you stared at the wonder in your hands and it was at this point that you noticed the tiny words had been carved to the wood in the front of the box, the color and light of the world. As the tune of the music box came to a close, you tore your eyes away from the masterpiece and quietly debated with yourself if it would be appropriate to take the music box with you, or if you should leave it exactly where you found it. Upon closing the music box, you blinked in surprise, for it almost fell as the light from the room that you had been relying on extinguished, leaving you in a heavy blanket of black. Instantly, you began to worry. Not because of the darkness. You didn't find the darkness to be particularly scary, nor did you even worry about the unnatural way in which your light source had, been, had seemed to vanish. You were more worried about accidentally running into those ancient items in the room and disturbing them, if not possibly breaking them. It would seem that you wouldn't have to worry for long, for the light soon returned to you, yet not from your original source, and it was be quickly beginning to dawn on you that you had no idea where the light was even coming from to begin with. Your head turned to the direction of the light, as it seemed to be coming from the back corner of the room one of those shadowy areas of the basement, now illuminated in a pale, shining glow. Just like when you had found the key in the dusty corner of your closet, there was no logical reason to explain the light that emitted from this corner. Standing up to your full height and lightly placing the music box on the top of the blue cabinet, you stepped hesitantly towards the light at first. 
Yet you couldn't feel, you couldn't help but feel warmed and calmed by its glow the closer you got as you navigated your way past furniture, items, and odds and ends. Coming to a halt in front of the source of light, you now noted it to be a door, a very small door. It was small to the point where you did, didn't think that you would have to crawl, but you would definitely have to hunch over in order to fit. Yet you were confident that you would be able to squeeze yourself through. The light, you now noted, came from the spaces and cracks between the door and, wall, and walls, floor, and ceiling. Stepping back and taking a moment to look at the door itself, it was painted in a light red that couldn't be quite considered pink, yet it was close enough. There was a half-circle design extended from the bottom of the corner of the door with light lines emitting from the circle that reminded you strangely of sunlight, even though the color of the circle was blue. I wonder where this door goes to, you thought out loud as you twisted the knob, expecting the half-door to just be locked like the, all the other things in this basement. You were surprised to note that while you intended to keep your voice down, as you spoke to yourself, you didn't mean to make your voice that quiet. It was almost as if something was hushing you. A heavy sensation pressed down upon your ears. The same feeling that only the quietest space could produce. It opened! You exclaimed as the door did in fact allow you to access to whatever was beyond. And you didn't fail to note that this time, as you, pur uh, as you purposefully allowed your voice to speak at its normal volume, it only came out sounded like a whisper. As you pulled the door further open, the light that got all the the light got all the more brighter. To so the point it was almost blinding, and your eyes squinted in real retaliation to just how intrusive it was to your senses. In fact, you couldn't see anything but light, almost as if you were standing in front of the sun itself and staring directly at it as it rose in the sky canceling out the darkest and more stormy of nights. You stepped through the door, completely caught up in the moment at this point. You hunched your shoulders over so that it would be easy it would be you would be able to easily fit through the door. Closing your eyes completely and going so far as to cover them with your hands, you find yourself unable to look at anything, as long as the light shone so brightly. You are now completely into the next room now, and you crouched over so your back came into contact with the wall next to the other side of the door. You sit down the wall with your eyes covered and wondered if the harshness of this light would ever end. Eventually, though, it did begin to settle. The light began to ease up just a bit to the point where you were finally able to remove your hands from your eyes but still had yet to allow them to open and observe your surroundings. Eventually, though, your curious nature got the better of you. Ooh. Pretty boy Helen should be making his grand appearance soon. Ah, girl. Don't, don't, ooh. We got to find out. We has to, we has to find out, all right? All right. This is chapter four, A Guiding Star. Eyes flickering open, you had come to realize that the other side of the door was under, underwhelmingly and dull. Now that the harsh light that shone almost as if it had the intentions of blinding you had subsided, you were able to look around at the new room that you found yourself in. And it wasn't much. There were a few dusty boxes and crates sitting in the middle of the square room. But that was about it. Yet you suppose that the most notable feature about the room was that there was not one drop of color. The entire room was basked in a grim and deary shade of m monochrome, making the corners of the room too seem all the more shadowy. As it was almost as if all the color of the world had been snapped away, sapped away, and maybe even sucked into in the intrusive light that shone brightly upon the opening of the door. Getting up from your spot, as you had slouched against the wall next to the door that you had just came through in a reaction to the light that had blinded you, you took a hesitant step forward and completely ignored all rational and reason that urged you to turn back. As your shoe came into contact with what you imagined to be a creaky wooden floor, 
No sound hit your ears. No creaks, no footsteps echoing against the walls. Nothing at all. That's strange. You mused, only to attempt to let out a panicked gasp and quickly reach your hands up to your throat in confusion. You had just tried to speak. You had done all of the proper emotions and actions that speech required, opening your mouth and allowing your vocal cords to vibrate as you attempted to allow the words and sound to come out of your mouth. Yet, not even a whisper of a note hit your ears. Something was holding the sound back, muting you and stealing fr from you your most trusted form of communication. Now that you thought about it a little bit more, you attempted to strain your ears in an effort to hear anything. Yet the heavy and deliberating silence pressed up down upon you like the tension of a fifth of a fifty, maybe even one hundred pound weight resting upon your shoulders. Shaking your head a bit in disbelief, you looked over your shoulder and stared at the door that would take you back to the place that made more sense. But did you really want to turn back now? After all, this was the most particular and curious environment, and it, would, it was obvious that there was more to see. For if you looked beyond the boxes and crates that were stacked in the middle of the room, you could see that there was a pathway to follow, a single white road almost like a sidewalk, that extended into a pit of black. The road almost seemed to flow in the darkness, for there were no dis dis dismirable, dismirable walls, floors, or ceilings. You wonder what would happen if you were to fall off. Would you continue to descend into a darkless, bottomless pit forever, or would you eventually come into contact with something? Additionally, the room, this room looked to be so dark now, where was the blinding light? Where did it go? Why did you just feel curious to follow it? Maybe it was your curiosity, curious nature getting the better of you once again? You suppose that curiosity did have the potential to get you in trouble. But how boring life would be if you didn't take the chance to explore. True that. While managing to find several logical reasons to turn back now, exit the basement, and never come back to this place again, you also found just as many reasons to continue onward. Reaching back towards the door that, you, that would take you home, you tugged a bit at the door and was very pleased to see that it still remained open and unlocked. Figuring that you very well didn't wish to lock yourself in this pleasantly unusual place. You pulled one of the boxes towards the door and stuck it in between the door and the frame, ensuing that the door would remain propped open and allowed, allowing you access back to the world that you came from. At long last, you had come to the decision that you would follow the pathway. Even, even you had to admit, at first you were a little hesitant to place your foot upon the path and completely suspend yourself over a, the pit of darkness. And even you felt a little a bit tempted to extend your arms out in order to keep your balance. For the path was all not that wide. Yet the more steps you took, the more, the more comfortable you became. And the more com confidence you gained. You wondered if the further you stepped away from the room with the boxes and doors, it would slowly begin to fade into da the darkness. Would it disappear completely? Eyes straining to the best of their ability, for a while the only thing that you could see was your shadowy surroundings and the white sidewalk that you walked upon. Yet as a few minutes went by, you noticed a few spots glinting in the distance, shining almost like stars on a crisp and clear night. As you continued to walk, not only did the glowing spots grow closer, but they began to increase in numbers. Soon enough, you were surrounded by them completely. The sparkling and shining light that had emitted was peaceful and warm. You almost felt like you were standing in the middle of some mythical galaxy where the stars danced around you, be beckoning you and urging you to follow, reassuring you that they knew the way. In fact, the further you followed them, the more it seemed like they actually were guiding you, raising your spirits and encouraging you as if to say that you would be there soon. Yet... You couldn't be expected to remain on this path forever. It would eventually have to end, and the end would be only confirmed by another blinding light that shone harshly in the distance. You're a bit hesitant to approach that light, for it has 
it, for it wasn't anything like the pleasant light that your star-like guides emitted. You put up a hand in order to shield your eyes, for the closer you got, the more intrusive the light became. It eventually came to the point where you could barely see at all, and were forced to keep your eyes blankly planted firmly at your feet in front of you. For you didn't want this light to drive you off the path and didn't and cause you to fall off. It would seem that by this point, your little star friends began to fade away, one by one, as they were inevitably overpowered by the stronger light. You had to say that you were a bit sad to see them go. You liked the warmth and strange security that they provided, almost as they were protecting you from something dangerous that lurked in this darkness beyond. Continuing to stare at your feet and avoiding a full-faced blast of light that seemed to rival nothing but the sun itself at this point, you came to realize that the other stable-looking surface came within your line of vision. And it was then that you realized that this was where the path ended. Taking a final step off the path and onto what looked like to be a grassy surface below, you still didn't ha fail to notice that you would normally it would normally be lush and green grass and green grass was void of any color. Surely, excuse me, sure, you could reach down and feel the cool, soft blades of grass in between your fingers. And they harbored all the same textures that normal grass did. Even it emitted a springy, earthy scent. The only thing was that it was missing was color. As soon as both of your feet came into contact with the grass, the harsh light had once again diminished. It didn't leave you in darkness, but it still left you with a respectable amount of light to see, almost as if you were standing in the middle of a late morning. All of the features of the grassy plain that you were standing in was absolutely visible to you. It was at this point that it dawned on you. Was the harsh light leading you somewhere? Every time it had shown and you followed it, it would eventually dis dissipate once you made progress on a specific path. What was the light trying to tell you? Wondering about the grassy plain, you noted that one side of the field ended at the borderline of a forest. The tree line was dark as the undergrowth, bushes, branches, and, wa and vines twist <coughs> me, twisted together and somewhat stir together somewhat sternly and acted as a barrier of sorts or maybe even a warning either way you figured that the forest was most likely a dangerous place who even knew what type of animals creatures or inhabitants roamed around up in this world on one hand a forest may be a place where dangerous situations presented themselves yet on the other hand it could be po it had the possibility to be sheltering and shielding you suppose that many hiding places could prevent could present themselves to you, and if you had to be honest, a forest seemed a bit more interesting to explore. On the other hand, on the other side of the field, a single path, much much along the same nature of the path that you had just been that you just followed, continued to wind through fields, plains, and valleys. As far as you were able to see, did you really want to follow the path? You didn't even know how far you wanted to explore what you were now understanding to be a whole new world. You feared that if you followed the long and twisted path, it would never end. You would, would endlessly be led along the path, your curiosity quite never satisfied, for you would always find yourself wondering what was to come next. That is actually really understanding right there. Eyes fixating themselves on the colorless woods towards your left, you jumped a bit in surprise to see rustling and movement among the tree line, despite the absence of wind. So far, you had yet to come across any actual living being in this world, and if you were to exclude the stars that almost seemed to have their minds of their own as they guided you here, yet you were, yes, you were curious and adventurous, but you weren't stupid and naive. You knew all too well that there was a huge possibility that this newcomer would not be friendly. Backing away a bit, you quickly began to look out for an escape route, or even a hiding place. Yet, in this grassy and open field, you weren't left with many options. Soon, a figure finally decided to emerge from the tree line. Your eyes, you strained your eyes to assess the figure, de and determined if he, she, or they were a threat or not. 
It was obvious that the person noticed you too, and most likely had decided that you were non-threatening, or even maybe an easy target, for they began to approach you. You raised a quizzical eyebrow as they observed their stance as you, as you observed their stance and posture. They were certainly they certainly seemed non threatening, for their shoulders were relaxed, and the pace at which they walked was le leisurely. As the person grew closer to you, you were soon able to make in a, into account more physical features, and it was easy for you to tell that this person was male. Of course, there were no colors to describe him as well, but the darker shade of his hair in comparison of, to his skin indicated that if he was in color, he would most likely have dark, if not deep, black hair and pale skin. His eyes almost seemed to be lighter as well, and his hair was a bit on the longer side, with bangs that fall into his eyes. That fell into his eyes. In fact, it almost seemed as if his skin was made out of porcelain due to how smooth it looked. Yet you didn't fail to notice the birthmark that rested towards the side of his right eye. He was, on average, height and seemed to be an overly healthy-looking weight. He wore a colored col collared jacket in a darker shade, and underneath his jacket rested a finely ironed star white button up shirt. Black dress pants covered his legs, yet you didn't fail to notice the knife that was strapped to his belt. Eyes locating to the knife, you immediately took several steps away, which was something that the man seemed to pick up on almost instantly. Shaking his head lightly in the negative, he held his empty hands up in the air in front of him and far away from his weapon, almost as if he was trying to convince you that you were he meant you no harm. Continuing to look at you questioningly, he then pointed a finger to his chest, and it was then that you noticed that the particular pin that rested upon his jacket, it was a circular pin, and strangely enough, had a design that looked like a smile painted on it. You furred your eyebrows in the direction of the pen before looking back up at him questioningly. The man then pointed towards you, and the spot that you were most likely pinned that you would most likely pin something to your shirt if you had anything you were you were pin wise. You continued to do nothing but stare at him in fascination, confusion, and wonder. But stare <laughs> oh, excuse me <laughs> only to shake your head towards him in an attempt to tell him about that you had no idea what he was talking about. Eyes widening and what seemed to be understanding, the man gave you an apologetic look before lightly grabbing your wrist and tugging it, almost as if he was asking you to follow him deeper into the woods. Towards the edge of the tree line and the end of the direction, the man was obviously wanting you to go. A few of the star friends that guided you to this field in the first place hovered warming, warmly, calling you towards them in the opposite direction, towards the path that continued through open fields and valleys, the harsh and blinding light began to glow once again. Pretty boy Helen. Ooh, it's getting interesting. All right, let's go to the next chapter. We can move one more. All right, so this is, I believe, is... chapter. Yeah, this is chapter five. A shadowy forest. You really didn't know what you were thinking when you decided to follow the strange man into the woods. As every contradicting piece of common sense and knowledge that you had gained during the past 24 years of your life became inc incon un inconsequential. At this point, you were going off the two new instincts that you had acquired during your brief and limited time in this new world, the two contrasting sources of light. On one hand, you had a bright, blinding, and almost artificial looking light that was harsh, intrusive, and seemed to be frantically attempting you to draw you in. Almost, it almost seemed like it was trying to be inviting, yet something just seemed wrong. On the other hand, you had the soft and glowing floating lights that you had followed across the sidewalk path. The lights that you were now considering, well, that you were now coming to refer to them as your star friends in your mind. For you didn't really know what else to call them. Your star friends, for some reason, seemed like something that you would trust, could trust, as they floated on the edge of the woods and briefly and blinked gently at you, beckoning you onward. The strange man had let go of your wrist at this point and headed back towards, ba and headed back off towards the forest, yet stopped only a few footsteps forward and looked back over his shoulder and, and at you questioningly, almost as if he was asking you if you were coming. 
You didn't fail to know how tra translucent eyes darted from the, towards the blinding light, which shone on the direction of the path as it continued through the grassy field. An almost nervous expression glinted across his face, as if to further back up the man's nonverbal claims and worries. One of your star friends floated towards you at an important pace. Circling itself around your wrist before zooming back towards the tree line. The section of your skin that your star friend had hovered felt warm and comforting. Closer to the sensation of sitting next to a crackling campfire on a chilly October evening. Catching the man's eyes, you nod your head once. The moment was brief and curt, as if to reassure him that yes, you would follow. Gaining, gaining this confirmation, the man turned back around and headed swiftly towards the coverage of the forest. And you took this as your cue to follow at this time, at, at this same, at the same brick pace, brisk pace. It was like he wanted to get you out of this open field as quickly as possible. You, once you were in the safety of the trees, the man slowed back down to a walk, although his pace was far from comfortable. Instead, he looked on edge, and you couldn't help but feel a twang of nervousness as you fell into step a little bit behind him. Where was he leading you? Did he look nervous because of what was out there? Was there a potential threat that you needed to be concerned with in the, these parts? Or did the dangerous creatures lurk in these woods? Your eyes landed on the knife on its holder that remained securely strapped to his belt. What if he was planning on using it? Was he trying to lure you in? Just like you had... Like, just like you suspected the harsh light was trying to do? You glanced nervously towards your star friends for guidance, to which they merrily blinked at you softly. Well, you suppose that it wasn't like they'd be able to physically answer you. There was a whole no sound crap. There was this whole no sound crap that was really starting to get on your nerves. How are you, able to, how are you supposed to communicate with anyone now? Easy. Pencil and paper. <laughs> or you could just write it on the ground, you know? The deeper you traveled into the woods, the more you were beginning to realize that they were just that these were just like any other expanse of woods that you were used to seeing back home. Except, of course, it appeared to be more of a shadowy, the more shadowy as no color greeted your eyes. Oh my goodness. That and also the fact that it was completely an unsettling silent, unsettlingly silent. No s normal sound greeted your ears such as the chirping of birds or the bubbling sound of water running through a creek. No buzzing insects or the scurrying and scampering around of woodland creatures running through the undergrowth. It was deathly silent, and the further you walked, the more uncomfortable you became. Taking an unconscious step closer to the man, you now became fearful that you would lose him in this shadowy and noiseless forest. What would happen if you had lost sight of him? You wouldn't be able to hear the sound of his footsteps, nor you would be able to regain, signal him of your location should you become separated. Due to your never-ending thoughts and curiosities, you had failed to at least attempt to discern what you were go where you were going and the path that you had taken to come here. You would surely become lost and able to find your way back to the field, which was inevitably your path back home. Almost if they, they sensed your discontent, your discontent, your star friends be once again blinked at you reassuringly, almost as if to tell you that they would escort you to wherever it was you needed to go. You weren't sure why, but even if you didn't fully trust the man before you, you somehow found it easy, quite easy to put your trust in the stars. After walking for ages, you started to become you started to be to come to a point where the woods became all the more darker. Yet the man continued. You stopped for a moment to stare judgingly at the darkness of the forest before you. Uh, the man stopped once again and looked over his shoulder. You wondered why he was able to, quick, to so quickly tell that you were no longer directly behind him. For it wasn't like he had the sound of your hauling footsteps to clue him in. Yet somehow he knew. Turning around fully, he silently approached you. And you kept your eyes on his knife. Wondering if he were to end you. Where would he do it? Would he do it now? Yet he did nothing of the sort. He merely reached a gentle hand out again and grasped and wrapped it lightly around your wrist. You attempted to look at him in the eye. 
Yet it would seem that he was unable to hold direct co eye contact with you. A few of your stars approached you and shone brightly in an attempt to light up the ex expression on the man's face in the midst of the shadows, allowing you to see clearly the almost pleading look that was there. Attempting once again, yet failing to catch his eye, you gave him another nod and affirmation. And the man turned back around. This time, though, he didn't let go of your wrist. And your star friends floated closely towards your side, surrounding you from each, each corner and angle as you stepped even further into the darkest part of this forest. Pushing past branches, bushes, and ferns in what you assume to be the most secluded and well-hidden part of the forest, due to the vast amount of vegetation that surrounded the entire place, a small wooden house stood. Judging from the size, it was most likely only three to four rooms in all, yet you couldn't be sure unless you stepped inside. The man continued to walk towards the house, and you wondered if this is where he lived. As you approached the house, you couldn't help but feel the most particular sensation deep within the pits of your ears, almost as if there was a heavy and substantial pressure slowly being relieved. Pausing in uncertainty in front, <clears throat> pausing in uncertainty in front of the door that would lead you inside into the house, the man once again turned to look at you. Yet this time. You could tell that he attempted to speak. His lips began to move. You strained your ears in a desperate attempt to pick up on what he was trying to say. And you listened closely enough. You could barely make it out. You'll understand soon. Without furthering as to how or why, you followed him through, and through, that, through the door. Immediately, upon crossing the other side, you clapped your hands over your ears in distress at the uncomfortable feeling of popping in your ears, almost like your ears had closed up after traveling to a high elevation, and they had been relieved. Uh? Like, uh? The fuck? <laughs> you almost surprised yourself as you noticed your feelings of pain, and your face screwed up in confusion as you were once again granted access not only to your voice, but to sound itself. It almost felt like all the sound in the world became rushing to you all once again, harshly invading your ears and driving you into a sensory overload. I'm sorry. A new, smooth, and polite-sounding voice now greeted your ears, and your gaze shot into the direction and surprised that someone was actually speaking to you. I wish I was able to warn you. You. You so responded as you let your hands drop again drop to your sides slowly getting used to the sensation of noise all over again you led me here yes the man responded blankly and it was quickly dawning on you that this man that this was not a man who had a way with who had a way with words dressing you to step further inside the house the man headed further into the main area of the house which wasn't all that big and made up the kitchen dining and living area all the furniture was handcrafted and you could even find some similarities in the craftsmanship between this furniture and the furniture that was still sitting in your basement. The walls were covered from floor to ceiling with clocks. <coughs> Excuse me. Each one its own masterpiece and work of art. Some of them were cuckoo clocks. And you imagined that this sound filled the house became quite nosy on the, on the strike of each hour. The constant ticking of all the clocks in union, union somehow didn't annoy you. Maybe it was because you found yourself so desperate for any source of noise in, other, in, a, in an otherwise soundless world. Reaching a hand up and lightly brushing across a cabinet that was pushed up further against the wall, you wondered if this man had made up all this furniture. Did you make all this stuff? You ask in curiosity. No. The man responded as he headed towards the kitchen area and began to prepare something. It looked like to be a tree tray, tea tray of sorts. Somehow there was only one teacup on it. My grandfather did. Oh. You answered lightly. I. The man began to speak before trailing off to silence with his back still turned to you. It would seem that he had a bit of trouble praising his words and thoughts together. Somehow you knew that the... But the reason was more than just being a resident of a soundless world. Maybe it was just his personality. Maybe he just couldn't quite easily translate his thoughts into sentences. I'm making his lunch now, my grandfather. The man continued, finally finding his words. I take care of him. When I've got, when I got, I've got, 
everything ready, you can see if he's able, he can answer your questions if he's able. He repeated, he gets tired easily. The man attempted to explain, I don't want to overwhelm him. What about you? You asked, and the man who was currently pouring a small amount of soup into a bowl briefly paused his actions. I mean, I, I just meant, I don't want to overwhelm, I don't want to overwhelm your grandfather with questions either, but I do have a lot of them. The man lightly placed the bowl of soup upon the tray, and even thought his act, even though his actions were gentle, the sound of the bowl clattering against the tray sounded loud and startling. I can try to, he said lightly. Although, one thing I can tell you right now is that this house is the only place in this world where we can talk like this. Once we step back outside, everything becomes mute again. How come? You asked in curiosity. The man picked up the lunch tray and began to walk towards another, another door, presumably his grandfather's room. Because of my grandfather. The man answered simply, he's called Dorian. If, he, if he'll see you, you may call him that. What's your name, then? You continue to question. Your curiosity is just too great for you to contain. You sincerely hope that you weren't annoying the man with your constant questions. Helen. The man calmly answered, looking over his shoulder before disappearing into the, into the, behind the door to his grandfather's room. He, thought, he thoughtfully considered you. What's yours? I'm Wyan. Oh, look at that. Helen, Greek, or excuse me, origin, Greek, meaning light slash bright. Dorian, origin, origin, Greek, meaning child of the sea. A Dorian can also refer to a type of minor mode in music, l lending the name, the name meanings of sound, of music and sound. Interesting. I like that you put meaning into the names. I didn't know that. Wow, this is actually really thought out through. I like that. Aria, it doesn't hurt me one more because I really want to find out because I honestly, I like the detail that they like put incorporating the names and the meanings of it. And I also like really, really want to find out. So we give me one more chapter, doesn't hurt. <coughs> one more. <coughs> Excuse me. Though I might regret this while I'm editing, but it's okay. It'll be worth it. Everyone will enjoy. Anyways, I believe this is chapter six. Because you're at three, four, five, six. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is chapter six. If I'm wrong, I'll, I'll put it on the corner somewhere on the screen. To let you know if I'm wrong. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. Anyways, um, chapter six, presumably. A beautiful clock. After the man, who you knew to be called Helen, disappeared behind the door to his grandfather's room, you took an additional movement to observe your surroundings. There must have been hundreds of different clocks covering the walls, and you imagined that, there, that, that under any other circumstances, you would have become annoyed rather quickly, yet not here. The constant ticking and talking was comforting, to say the least. Eyes traveling to the longest wooden wall of the room, which wasn't all that long, for the room for the room that wasn't that big you almost instantly caught the sight of what you presumed to be the four main clocks of the room approaching the walls you took in their features in their entirety the two center clocks most the two center most clocks were the biggest of the four although all of them were meticulously crafted with obvious care and devotion and each had their own respective designs that carved and wilted into the wood. Additionally, one, each one included a figurine displayed in the center of the clock, standing on a pedestal of sorts and rendering the face of, a clock, of the clock useless. Yet you suppose that one was not looking at these clocks in order to tell time anyway. One of the center clocks had curved, Curv curvatures and even a few musical notes carved into the wood the figure of an older looking man standing in the center he had hair that you had guessed was supposed to mimic graying or age and a few wrinkles had been carved into his face underneath the face of underneath the face of the clock the words the word sound had been carved into the wood in an elegant curling font the second clock that sat in the center harbored 
an almost wave-like formation in the wood. And you felt the sensation of one of if one section of wood almost bleeding into the next. Much like the way the distinct colors of the rainbow are star star startingly different as they were. Still managed to fade into the next hue. The figure that stood out in front of the face of the clock was that of a woman with long flowing hair. Due to the shadowy shade of her hair, you pictured her to have rather dark hair, yet translucent eyes. The word color was carved into this clock. You're turning your attention to the outermost clocks, which was a bit smaller, but still much more magnificent, magnified than any other clocks in the room. You noted that one of the hanging, the, the one hanging up next to the clock that read sound was a clock with harsh, jagged lines carved into the woodwork. The figurine of a young woman stood, with shoulder-length black hair and eyes much darker than the figure of the other woman. But underneath the face of this wood, the word literature had been carved, yet you held the most interest in the last clock. The one that hanged up next to the clock that would color, this clock, at least to you, almost seemed to shine. It had star-like designs carved into it, and the figuring was that of a young man with black hair and translucent eyes. You reached out, <coughs> excuse me, you reached a hand in curiosity, almost desperate to brush your fingers across the clock, the clock that read light, and wondered if the wood was as soft and warm as it looked. Yet your fingers had the chance. Yet before your fingers had the chance to come into contact with the soft wood. <coughs> Excuse me, with the soft looking wood, the sound of the door opening behind you almost made you jump. And you raced back towards your better senses. After all, you had no idea how old these clocks were. For all you knew, they could be fragile. And they certainly <coughs> excuse me, were important to Helen and his grandfather. It definitely wasn't your place to go touching around the clocks. If, I hope you guys heard that. You didn't want to break them or leave your oily fingerprints all over them. <coughs> you found the clocks. Helen stated quietly as he approached you, coming to a stop next to you and allowing his own eyes to travel across each one. They're beautiful, you breathed in response. I was just admiring them. I can tell they're special. They present my family. Helen offered some information, and you could tell that he was trying very hard to explain. Yet his facial expression told him that he was having a difficult time doing so. My grandfather, Dorian, is sound. My younger sister, Sophie, is literature. And this one is me. He finished pointing towards the clock that stated light. What about color? You asked in intrigue, quickly noting that he failed to explain the final clock. The one that showed a woman looking strikingly like him. Even more so than Sophie, his supposed sister. Show, sure, Sophie had appeared to have black hair as well, yet her eyes didn't harbor the same light appearance as the other. Slightly looking older, the slightly looking, older looking woman. A sudden look crossed Helen's face, and you instantly regretted your question, wondering if you had hit a sensitive topic. Yet it would seem that Helen was inclined to give you an answer, for he spoke up again. That's my mother. He, mum he murmured in his quietest, reversed way of speaking. Her name is Iris. You wondered what happened to Helen's mother, yet didn't find it appropriate to continue questioning him on the matter. Nor <coughs> excuse me, did it seem like Helen was inclined to give you any more information concerning this topic. For he merely stuffed his hands up in his pockets of his pants and breathed out another sigh. I'm sorry. He apologized. I I'm not the best at explaining things. My grandfather said he'd like to speak with you, by the way. You can see you can see him whenever you're ready. He and my sister are better at talking than I am. Is your sister here too? You asked in intrigue, taking a moment to look around the tiny room for any indication on um, that there was another person there. However, Helen shook his head in the negative. She stays near the library. You're, he answered critically, "It's far from here." Your question, your expression settled into one of confusion at this answer. An expression that was all too ob obvious to Helen. Just go talk to my grandfather, he mumbled as he took a step towards the door. That'll be more productive. All I do is confuse you. 
No, you're fine. He attempted to reassure him. I shouldn't be asking so many questions. I guess sometimes I just can't help it, though. I get curious. At your answer, much to your surprise, Helen let out a small smile. One of the first ones that you had seen from him, y you came to know. It's nice to come across someone who is curious about anything. He stated, a lot of people don't seem to wonder or even care about why things are the way they are. Allowing to his incomplete thought to trail off into silence, Helen continued towards the door to his grandfather's room and gestured you for you to follow. Come through here. He invited, before softly knocking on the door. Granddad? He asked quietly next, calling out for permission to enter his grandfather's room again. Are you still okay for a visitor? You strained your ears to hear an answer from the other side, and it didn't take long for an affirmative answer to come from within. The voice belonged to an elderly man. <coughs> Excuse me. In response, Helen caught your eye and gave you a soft nod before opening the wooden door. The creaking sound of the door protesting the action uh, hitting your ears. And now, excuse me, and you found satisfaction in it. You never realized how much you had taken things like noise for granted until you experienced a world without it. Following Helen into the room, you caught sight of the ev evidently aged and frail looking man sitting at a chair at a, in a chair at the desk. The lunch tray that Helen fixed for him remained in its untouched state at the table next to him, as he was intently carving what looked to be a box of some sorts. He was quite thin, and you could tell he was not eating as much as he probably should have been. This thought was only confirmed by the concerned way that Helen had glanced at the tray of disregarded food, and he had over and had even opened his mouth in order to make a comment about this. Yet, it would seem that he had decided to keep quiet, for he merely let out a disappointed breath of air through his nose and shook his head in worry. More than several wrinkles found their way into creases of Dorian's pale, paper-thin skin, and the shades of his hair was close as white at this point. Looking up at you with pale eyes that matched Helen's, the man gave you an amused-looking grin. So, you're the one that found my old house. He questioned knowingly. I'm impressed that you managed to fire away here. The look on Helen's face morphed in from worry to confusion at his grandfather's words. Yet he still decided to remain silent. It was obvious that he had absolutely no idea to what, his Dor the, to what Dorian was talking about. You built that house? You asked in wonder. Mind instantly returning to the basement of the house that your family moved into. Filled to the brim with all the strangely colored furniture. All of those music boxes, clocks, toys, lamps, and everything else that you found there. Did you finally come across the creator of those items? I did. Dorian confirmed. Granted, it's been decades since I visited. I do hope that the house hasn't been repainted. I'd rather like the colors I've chosen for it. I don't know about repainted. You mused. Although the color choice is interesting. And not a lot of people would have chose those colors, but if I had to be honest, I think it's pleasant. Dorian smiled peacefully at the thought, and my furniture in the basement? I think it's been left untouched, you confirmed. I hope you don't mind that I found it. On the contrary, I've been waiting for someone from your world to come across it, Dorian explained. I've left it there for someone to find. All I could hope was for that whoever found it would appreciate it. I'll make sure to keep it safe, you promised. After all, they are magnificent works of art. Thank you. Dorian breathed before once again returning his attention to the box that he was carving. Now, I'm sure you have a lot of questions about this world. It is certainly a bit different from the world you've come from. However, before I begin to explain, I must ask Helen, how did you know to bring her here? You have no, lo you have no knowledge of the world she came from, after all. If Helen was confused... He masked it well. Up until now, it did not occur to you that Helen didn't know anything of your home world, and you had stumbled across this new world almost by accident. The lights guided me. Helen answered, I've always followed the lights. They led me to her, and when they did, I saw her following them as well. You can see the lights? Dorian asked in interest. They don't reveal themselves to most. In fact, Helen's the only person I've ever come across that can see them. You mean the stars? <clears throat> you asked, because I saw two distinct lights. 
One of the lights were more soft and floating, like little stars. The other light was harsh and intrusive. Yes, Dorian acknowledged. The harsh light that you speak of leads to the city. The city itself is not dangerous. Some of the people there are. You mustn't follow that light alone, especially since you have no knowledge of this world. That light is artificial and fake, and it can't be trusted. I won't, you promised. Doran looked at you with eyes that betrayed, slight that betrayed slight disbelief. I do hope your curiosity doesn't get you into trouble, he critically stated, and you stiffened up at the warning. However, since you do seem to be a curious one, I suppose that you would be interested in hearing a bit more of, of the story about this world. For example, did you know that this world wasn't always censored, mute, and colorless? Ooh, damn! <clears throat> My cat's looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> Sorry, sweetie. Okay, but Sophie, origin, Greek, meaning wisdom. Iris, origin, Greek, meaning rainbow. Ooh. Now I'm curious. I'm very curious. Um, I'm very curious. Now that we've discovered these, I think I'm going to go ahead and let you guys know, like, the meanings of the characters in the description or maybe in the comments down below if I remember to do that. But I'll probably put it in the description most likely. Um, <clears throat> so you guys can kind of think about it and kind of theorize about it now. Because this is very interesting. Clearly the author did some work on this story. You know, not only did they create a whole little like, thing about like another world that's mute, colorless, and some other stuff. Now it's getting into details and then also involving their names equaling to meanings that portray the world like as if they as if the man created the world he gave them the assignments and you know he gave them those those things he made it like certain clocks based on what their name meanings and what they present or something like that it's it's very um interesting really um I wish I could read more, but then I would I would take forever to edit this, and I would feel really bad for you guys, and I know you expect something. Plus, I like read like four already, like three, four, five, and six, so yeah. Um, anyways, uh, let me know in the comments down below what you guys think, um, honestly, what's going to happen next, and how he's going to, like, what do you, how do you think this world... I can't say was created because that is one theory itself. Like how this how this world became became colorless and and void of noise. <clears throat> All except that one house with the clocks. Please let me know in the comment down comments down below. For me, honestly, I have a feeling that there's maybe some other hidden clocks or maybe a secret clock. That would tell us about like, cause I know, cause now we know that uh, Iris, which I'm pretty sure is his mom, is the one that was colored, and we currently he doesn't like to talk about her, and it seems like something happened to her, to where now it's a colorless world. So if the people aren't there anymore, they died, passed away, went back to the other world. It seems like what they presented goes away, and now there's um no color or barely any sound left so there might be two people or one person i don't know <clears throat> but i would appreciate hearing your guys' theories about it um because i'm really curious this is really getting very interesting and i do appreciate the author for being very um very because this is like the first time i've read a helen story that like is actually very like very creative to me but honestly I'm, I'm, I'm like I'm considering reading the next chapter just to find out but I have to hold that out I'm sorry y'all I have to hold it out I'm sorry I'm so sorry but while I'm holding it out on you guys why don't you go ahead and give me a like and subscribe and hit that, that notification bell for one of these videos so then I won't have to hold on you guys so much <laughs> just kidding um and i'll be and you'll be notified when i post a new video of this series because i know you guys will be waiting for one as soon as i post it and you guys finish this video um 
So yeah, it's it's gonna get interesting. It's gonna get very interesting, very much. I can't wait to t to find out what the grandfather is gonna tell us. Very interesting. I wonder if he even made. Crazy. I don't know. I don't wanna. I don't wanna go too much into theories because then I'm gonna be here out for an hour. Um, but anyways, sadly your girl's gotta go. Um, I do hope you guys have a wonderful day and think about this book. Think about it. Just think about it. Just think about it. Keep it in your head, kind of make up theories and everything. Just think about it. Because I'm going to be thinking about it now. But anyways, uh, <laughs> I got to go. Bye and peace.